Hello, everyone, and welcome. You know, on this episode, we have a very special guest. It's Dr. Michael Fenster. Uh, he's not only a board-certified interventional cardiologist, he's also a pro professor of culinary medicine and professional chef. chef. He combines his culinary talents with medical expertise uh, to forge and help his patients approach life from a very, very um, holistic health angle. He earned his medical degree from the Medical College of Virginia, and he also earned a culinary degree uh, from Ashworth University and an executive MBA from Harvard University. He's the author of four books, which includes Eating Well, Living Better, The Fallacy of Calorie, Asian Heats, and um, So to learn more, we'll have the link to his book in the show notes. Uh, Dr. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited about our conversation, and I believe our guests will learn a lot from you too. Oh, well, thank you, Julie. It's, it's so much fun to be with you today. So uh, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. It's really a pleasure. So before we dive into the conversation about food and health, which I know we can talk about for hours if we have that time, I want to learn more about you. Tell us about you. What led you uh, to this field? What led you in this direction? and to your career path today. Sure. So actually, a lot of people, uh, you know, come to the food medicine space, uh, particularly a lot of my colleagues, you know, going through medicine and learning about nutrition, etc. I kind of came at, at from the other way, actually. So uh, my mom was a great home cook, and we moved around. I'm going to give away how old I am now. Uh, mm -hmm. But we moved around a lot in the days before the internet. Uh, believe it, mm -hmm. folks, there, there was a time, the dark <laughs> ages. And uh, so as a sort of always a new kid uh, in school, uh, the kitchen became quite a refuge for me. So I learned to cook along with my mom. And uh, then when I went off to college to help pay for college and get through college, um, the restaurant industry was natural place for me to start. And so I actually started there as a dishwasher. And by the time I graduated, uh, I had worked myself up to what today we would call sort of an executive chef running the back of the house on, on the weekends, um, weekend days, et cetera. And uh, then I went off to medical school, became an interventional cardiologist, but always kept that love of of food uh, and uh, everything that surrounds that whole food experience uh, from the hospitality industry with me. And at some point, points after uh, I had started on my uh, professional medical career path, I had some serious health challenges. And uh, I really had to go back and examine, you know, what I knew about food and health. And, and certainly I knew what good food was, how to make good food, what real authentic food was and, and the power of that. Um, but uh, I think like a lot of physicians might sheepishly admit, uh, you know, we don't always practice what we preach. And so uh, medicine is a very busy field. You know, I was an intern, a resident, uh, then a very busy cardiology fellow working in St. Hours, you know, doing lots of cases, and so um, my diet was basically horrible. Uh, it was, it was, you know, the average American's diet, sort of on steroids. And I looked, I said, you know, I know the one thing I can do is change my diet. And the root of my problems were really uh, routed in, in inflammatory processes. And so I did that because uh, I was confronted with an option of, of serious surgeries. And uh, I had success, personal success. Uh, but what's interesting, Julia, was my success was really um, counter to a lot of what I've been taught to tell patients, you know, mm -hmm. to eat this, don't eat that, do this, don't do that. And so I was, uh, my background also is I've spent a lot of time doing NIH research and mm -hmm. academic institutions and, and uh, those types of things. And so I did my own research and I said, well, wait a second, you know, that's, let me share this with my patients and see how they respond. And they had great outcomes. And so that was really the birth of this pathway towards culinary medicine uh, for me. So I sort of started out one way, went to medicine and then zigzagged, you know, back, bringing both of them uh, together. And, and and that's where we are today and uh, really at an exciting uh, intersection uh, in terms of where, you know, all this has come and, and where we're going and what to look forward to in the future. That's really, that's really, really um, interesting. And one of the key things that we know is that um, the future lies, with, with the future of medicine as a whole lies 
somewhere close at the intersection of people knowing how to take care of themselves through what they eat. And we also understanding how, oh, sorry, physicians now, understanding how they can help patients manage what they eat in a way to optimize their health. We talk about personalized medicine and we're talking about culinary medicine here. So I want to just bring the two together and say, what exactly um, is culinary medicine? Is it part of personalized medicine? Is it personalized medicine? Are they not related at all? Um, do you mind shedding some light on this? Oh, a a absolutely. You asked the great question and you hit on the key word. Uh, that you said, which was information. So, you know, if you Google uh, culinary medicine, I think you get like 23 million hits. It's all over the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And you have everything from sort of, you know, Bob's idea and sort of backyard homegrown uh, sorts of things from, from the University of Google uh, mm -hmm. with a hodgepodge <laughs> of things, um, all the way up to what I teach. And you mentioned, you know, my university course at the University of Montana. So we have to, acad I have to academically vet that to get the course approved, goes through a faculty senate process, et cetera. My dean reviews what I teach, you know, et cetera. And I have to provide the evidence base. So first of all, I would say when you're looking to sort out, well, what does culinary medicine mean? And and what is it I want it to mean to me? You know, which which menu, which culinary medicine restaurant do I want to go and get that information from? Um, you know, choose wisely. So, you know, ours and, and many other courses as well and other programs are evidence-based. So that's, that's the first thing I think you really have to look at is, you know, where does that evidence come from? Uh, ours is also what, what I would say is multidisciplinary. So, Quite often, you hear culinary medicine to turn, uh, discussed in terms, really, which is mostly nutrition. It's sort of they're trading nutrition for something that sounds a little sexier and will get people, you know, going to their program or buying their product or their books or whatever it is. But ours is very multidiscipline. And in fact, um, I'm writing a, a new book. You mentioned four, so five is on the way. And it will be the basis uh, of, of, of the textbook for our course, which has evolved over the decade or so that I've, I've been teaching it. And, and it's really based on information. So for physicians out there, uh, I, I want them to take a step back and think. So certainly when I was in college, I remember, you know, taking the, the, the cellular biology class as an undergraduate. And, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say once again, I had the original, you know, copy of the first edition of The Cell, uh, which is sort of the standard textbook. Um, the only good thing about that is I think I could sell a first edition and make some money if I needed. it. <laughs> uh, but what, what it was really about, and I think if you talk to people, you know, decades ago, they tell you, you know, oh, well, you know, medicine's about the cell and that's about proteins and cellular energy and mitochondria and, and these sorts of things. And I think if you talk to people now, we realize that it's really about the, the, the genome, right, the, the DNA, and we're looking at, at epigenetic effects of things and so on and so forth. Well, what is what is the DNA really, right? It's information. So in our our uh, culinary medicine class, we explore what what I call the food experience. So that combines all these things uh, that impact us when we eat. So not just the nutrients, obviously that's very important nutrition. We're not throwing that out the window. No no baby with the bathwater there. But certainly it's it's how we eat. Right there, there was a recent article showing that uh, people who are happier have better control of their diabetes. Uh, we know um, this is Mark Holder's research from the University of British Columbia that people that are happier, when we account for all the other variables, including illnesses, cholesterol, blood pressure, etc., people that are happier live not only better but they live almost seven years longer. So there are clear things that impact you know, impact uh, our food experience. Do we eat happy? Do we eat angry, uh, et cetera? And so we look at all those information channels and how they impact our food experience, um, which obviously a big part of that is also what we put on our plate. And we like to look at that in terms of, you know, is it 
in, in a very simple way. And again, to the information aspect, a very digital, a very binary choice. Is it something that's ultra processed? And we use the Nova classification developed by a professor, uh, Carlos Montiero from the University of Sao Paulo, adopted by the United Nations, many countries around the world as well. In fact, France just completed in 2022 or 2023, a four-year project looking at trying to reduce ultra processed food consumption of their population using the nova definition uh brazil uses nova definition in educating their public about it in the united states uh because of the food industry uh and the economics that we have shall we leave it at that uh and the influences that we have many people that i talk to including those in health-related fields, including, believe it or not, registered dietitians who take a lot of our, our class and with whom I work with uh, quite closely, have never heard of it, uh, never heard of the NOVA classification. So we look at those sorts of things, and, and that is really the focus of our culinary medicine thrust is to maximize, in a positive way, uh, our f relationship with food through our individual food experiences, which is simply every time we sit down to have something to eat. That's quite interesting. You know, when I'm when you're listening to what you're describing, and I, I, I think about uh, the genome, I think about what people talk about, especially the main concepts in genetics. We think about gene and environment equals phenotype. So your health outcome or your health experience is very related to your genes, but that's not the only thing. The environment is a key part of it. And food is a very big part of our environment because think about how much we put into our body every single day. So I know that this is very, very important. And going by what you're saying with regards to where you're teaching physicians and health professionals as a whole through your program, um, it looks like you are considering many factors. You're not just, it's not just about the food, it's about the genome, it's about um, um, also the mood around you as a person. So it's an holistic approach to um, eating. And one thing I'm, I'm thinking of here, and my main question here is, so when you think about practice of culinary medicine in terms of the experience people have, you are trying to help them Think of all the factors that would affect their health outcome, not just what you have on your plate alone, but you're educating them about um, all the other factors. Is that correct? Or am I getting this one? Absolutely. So all those factors that go into it, um, and, and we have to look at that on multiple levels. In a way, culinary medicine is the ultimate personalized medicine because what I love to eat and, and what's good for me uh, maybe something that you find very distasteful or might not work for you. And, and I think it does no good, you know, to take somebody, for example, who maybe is in an inner city, uh, you know, in the Southwest, who is used to a Southwestern or a Central American, Latin American cuisine and say, well, you have to eat a Mediterranean cuisine. And you have to eat all these things that are maybe not part of your culture where you come. So you're stressing them or you give somebody a diet uh, that's completely at odds with what their family consumes. And so you're introducing stressors uh, into their lives, uh, et cetera. So we have to take all these things, you know, into account. Um, but ultimately, you know, I, I remember thinking about writing uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago, you know, that the what you brought up, which is, you know, the environment and, and the genome and that age old argument, is it nature? Is it nurture? And, and really, I think we've come to a place uh, in looking at it, certainly in my world through my lens of culinary medicine, that there is no difference. Uh, because as you said, our biggest environmental exposure every day is the food we take from our outside environment and whatever that contains and bring it inside our body. Right. And then we have this interface, this natural interface called the gut microbiome. 
uh, that is dependent upon what we eat. It's dependent on what we feel. It's signaling and talking to us all the time. And and much like if anybody, you know, like me, big NV, NFL fan, I watch my football on Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. the, the gut bacteria, that's the offensive and defensive line. They're blocking and tackling, you know, for us mm -hmm. and creating those lanes. And, you know, they're the difference whether we throw a touchdown pass or, you know, we take a 10 yard sack. And, mm -hmm. and th that food is information which you know is uh deciphered by our body deciphered by the gut microbiome and then those molecules uh are then also uh communication right and that that is information but part of information uh in information theory which is what we're based on it's not just that it's a message right but we have to decode that message and that's where the personalization the individuality comes in so you know if somebody gives me a message um you know in russian i don't understand it uh so maybe that's a a food that my body really doesn't understand and and as an example uh for what, what we've seen for example there uh, i love sushi i've been to japan many times much martial arts in my background mm. and uh, I, I i love sushi and it, and it certainly can be good for me mm. but if somebody of japanese descent were to eat sushi uh in the nori wrapper there's actually a bioactive there that turns on a cancer prevention gene uh, for people who have that mutation. Um, they think that that was developed by many centuries, maybe millennia, of these people eating that seaweed, ingesting a certain bacteria that actually does that conversion, sends that signaling molecule. Um, and then there was also a study uh, just a couple of years ago done by an Israeli group, and this was fascinating, where they looked at the glycemic responses to all these different foods and highly individualized and looking at personalized response. And we would say in medicine, well, gosh, if you eat an ice cream sundae, that's going to send your blood sugar through the roof. And, you know, if you eat sushi, well, that's something that's generally pretty healthy for you. But there were individuals whose blood sugar spiked much worse with sushi than with an ice cream sundae. And that just goes to show how personal our experience is. I kind of liken it, and I don't want to get too metaphysical, but I love culinary medicine. You know, culinary medicine is like how we live as human beings and experience the universe. It's mm -hmm. individual. It's through our perception. And so I think it's one reason why all these approaches that are one size fits all or just a few sizes are always doomed to failure. So we ultimately have to work with that individual. And we're at the cusp with the information and technologies we have in AI, data processing, data gathering, et cetera, where we can start to unravel those types of patterns. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I was just thinking about people, people, for instance, people that are listening today, a lot of people are very curious about what can we do? What can I do? I'm not, I'm not a physician, I'm not a scientist, I don't even know anything about what you're talking about, but I want to eat well, I want to live healthier. So if that person is listening today and they, they are, I think they have those questions, what are some of the most effective approaches that people can take? Where can they start to help them um, move forward in terms of maximizing their health um, to what they eat? Well, the good news is it's actually pretty simple. And whenever I go out and I tell people that, and, you know, I give a talk or whatever, and I, I, I'm, I'll I, tell them ex what I'm going to tell you in just a minute, they kind of look a little disappointed, like, that's it? I know that. That's common sense. Give me something earth shattering, you know, Jeff, Dr. Mike. But it's really like, let's not eat garbage. And by garbage, I mean ultra processed food. So if we think about it. Uh, as human beings, we have evolved for hundreds of millions of years to get where we are today. Mm -hmm. And over the course of those hundreds of millions of years, the gut bacteria that we talked about, uh, people may refer to them as sort of those probiotics uh, that, that people take, but the gut bacteria, that's also co-evolved to co-metabolize those foods for mm -hmm. maximum health. These are our guests. These are our minions that live inside us. And so they want us to be healthy, too, because we're their home. And uh, if we think that, well, our physiology and our gut bacteria relationship, well, that hasn't changed for at least as long as there's been Homo sapiens. So that's around 250,000, maybe 300,000 years. Mm -hmm. And the natural foods haven't really changed. And so if we've seen this epidemic of obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and autism and all these things over the last 100 years, what has changed? Mm 
Well, the one variable is that the food has changed. And we now consume, the average American consumes almost 70% of their diet from ultra processed foods. So if you can start taking those out of your diet and off your plate, that's the single most important thing. And it's really simple. Just ask yourself, is it ultra processed or not? And one of the easiest ways to do it, believe it or not, is simply count. So flip over that ingredient label and simply count. You don't have to read mono, sodium, glue, whatever, you know, disulfate, you know, blah, 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 blah. Just count the ingredients. It turns out that if there are more than five ingredients, then about 80, 85% of the time it's ultra processed. So if you like you pick up an apple, right? There's no ingredient label. It's an apple. <laughs> you put you can put it in your cart. So, you know, just flip it over. You know, as I say, keep it to five to stay alive. If it's five or less, generally you're safe. If it's more than five and you could take it out of your cart and get something else, go with that. So simply getting that ultra processed food off our plate, it's that simple. Yeah, that keeping it um like because people will say an apple a day keeps uh it's a doctor away. Uh, <laughs> so that's a that's a great tip right there. And you know, that's on a personal level. So let's talk a little bit about um what we as a community, what leaders, our leaders can do uh to help uh some of these issues we're facing. More than 50% of Americans struggle with chronic diseases that are related to protein patterns. And ambiguity when it comes to the share guidelines is one of the reasons people give for not being able to eat well. Some of them, we talk about the higher cost of healthier food. So what are your thoughts on what can be done to tackle this issue? Not much on the individual level now, but even as a society uh, and even our leaders, policymakers, what can we do to tackle uh, some of the seizures? Well, I think one of the challenges uh, is, you know, I sort of hate to say it, but we run into the politics of food and the food industry. Um, and for anyone who thinks that's not really real, I urge them to read, you know, Mary Nestle's food politics book. Uh, you know, she does a, a great job with that. And, you know, that goes back several years and you can only imagine that it's accelerated uh, since then. So really, I think um, we as as a group of leaders, um, we need to be honest. We need to get past these um, ties that certain maybe influential individuals, you know, have. And, you know, f as we would say, you know, let the data lead us where, where it is, um, where it takes us. As I said, you know, because of, of what I say uh, about certain things, and obviously, right, Kraft uh, Nabisco is not going to be a big fan of me telling people not to buy Velveeta mac and cheese, you know, for a nightly uh, uh, a meal. Um, I have to have the evidence base. So I, I think as a group, we have to be open. Um, you know, people uh, and some of our leaders get caught in the trap of becoming very defensive about, you know, oh, no, we've done it this way for 50 years. Um, this is, you know, this is all that we know. Um, we, we have all the answers. We, we have to uh, understand um, that, you know, progress in requires breaking donors barriers and exploring new hypotheses. Too often in food and health, we have a narrative that we want. Let's say fat is bad and don't eat saturated fat. And we tell people that, and Americans listen, right? Uh, they statistically have decreased total fat consumption and saturated fat consumption, and yet they've gotten fatter and sicker uh, over the, the ensuing decades. And in France, you know, they eat way more fat than us. Um, they eat foie gras, they eat butter, they eat cheeses, and they have a cardiovascular, you know, event rate that's, you know, 30% of what it is in the United States. And instead of looking at that, and having it inspire us to say, wow, we have to re-examine a new hypothesis, we go, wow, that's the French paradox. Isn't that interesting? Let me put that on the shelf over here because that scares me because it's it it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And and you know, we need to unpack all those outliers and, and we need to see what is it telling us and and be unafraid uh to move forward. So I think in a big, big way, um education and a willingness to accept things. Because when I talk to people about food as information, 
I get glassy eyes and it's like, well, that's just crazy. Um, that's why I'm writing the textbook this semester. I've, I've actually canceled our class so I can get the textbook in of all the things that we teach um, because there's it, it draws from immunology and a lot of other disciplines. And I think sometimes, certainly as an interventional cardiologist, I was very guilty of it. I lived in my own little world of interventional cardiology for many decades. And that's great, um, but that old expression, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees uh, <laughs> comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that is very important. And we have to make it accessible so people can practice it. So as much as you and I have talked about some of the data and the studies and the, the science behind it, which is very important as a foundation, how do people apply it to their everyday life? And so as a chef, I tell people, well, gosh, you know, if I'm telling you to buy an organic carrot because it's a healthier option than these, um, you know, uh, orange number three dyed, you know, pre-cut carrots. And I'm asking you to spend more money because uh, you get the full carrot with the carrot greens on it. Well, let me give you a recipe so you don't throw those away. Um, now, to be honest, you know, these are all the things I did when I ran a professional restaurant. I ran a kitchen um, because you can't food costs are, are one of your biggest costs. So you don't waste anything. So when you do what we call trim, which is normally the vegetables that you peelings that you throw away, save those, uh, put them in a stock on a, on a, in a, uh, a big pot of water on a Sunday, throw some leftover bones in. And you know what? You have a stock that's better than the, I won't name them, uh, celebrity chef that's selling a quart of bone broth for $15. I kid you not. Uh, cause I, I checked it out, you know, in the store, you can make it for 15 cents. Um, so this is how people can use these sorts of things in their lives. And the information, if it doesn't become knowledge and doesn't be, become applied, then it's useless information. That's true. Absolutely true. And um, when you think about um, the next five years, the next um, eight years or 10 years, what would you like to see? When you think about the future of um, healthcare, especially when it comes to nutrition as well, what would you like to see? And what impact would you like to see culinary medicine, the knowledge you're sharing uh, create for uh, not just um, healthcare professionals, physicians as a whole? Well, I'd like to see, you know, obviously culinary medicine, you know, become its own, you know, recognized specialty so mm -hmm. that there are people, you know, within access points of the healthcare system that are doing this job, are uh, the bridge uh, between, you know, that food experience, you know, and health. So that's where I see that role. When it comes to the next decade, I get terribly excited. Uh, you know, uh, we are working on some projects, for example, that involve uh, the technologies that we have now that will allow us to accumulate a lot of this data. So, you know, a lot of the problem with food and nutrition information, quite frankly, is that the data is a lot of garbage, uh, to be honest. Uh, you know, we send out these uh, dietary recalls, uh, three-day dietary recall, uh, you know, uh, not even, it's a 24-hour dietary recall that's sent out to 5,000 people, you know, twice a year. And that's the basis of the government food recommendations, Okay. That's garbage. Uh, <laughs> we both know that. With the technologies, with our ability to get better information, uh, then we can. We also can change the way that we do science. And so, the way I was taught, my my NIH research grant, right? I had to come up with a hypothesis. I wrote my grant. Um, I spent a year in a microphysiology laboratory, and I tested that hypothesis. Uh, did this work? And it was a single variable that we looked at, etc. But that's not really how we do things now. So if you're looking at sort of the cutting edge cancer therapy, for example, uh, what we look at is we say, well, what is the correlation? Because we we can look at massive amounts of data between people who have this cancer and their genes, for example, right? And then it sorts itself out and we say, wow, this gene seems to be highly correlated with this cancer. What is it about this gene? What does it turn on or turn off, et cetera? Um, and so it becomes a different way of investigating science 
that's far removed from you know the origins of nutrition which were based really in looking at deficiency diseases and saying wow if you uh, don't have vitamin c you get scurvy uh, if you don't have this you get rickets so we give you vitamin c you don't get scurvy case closed but that's not how our bodies work and use information. It's, it's much more like a social network. And so something comes in and just think of it as a tweet, right? And so the response to that tweet depends on which cell is reading it and what they're going to do and who their neighbor is and who they're hanging out with and, and what that is. And that's how they respond and communicate. And so uh, it's, it, we're far beyond, you know, sort of this single variable, single effect uh, understanding. And I think we're really at, at the forefront of a new age. And, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, that response is, is a bit unique to every individual. So we, we have to then be able to calculate that in. The reality of the uh, universe, again, not to get too far out there, but if you if you uh, read like Carlos uh, Ravelli, who's a, a brilliant theoretical, uh, Italian theoretical physicist, um, nothing is unrelated and, and, and connected. You, you can't remove the observer from the universe or in culinary medicine, we as we like to say, you can't take the diner away from dinner. You know, without the diner, there's no dinner. And so the two are always build uh, and engage in this relationship. And and so we have to put that into the equation and work around it. And and we now have the tools to do it. And that is so exciting. It is exciting. And the future is really exciting as well. Because when you think about it, we know more about the human genome now than we've ever um, known before. And a lot of things that before were very expensive and not accessible to um, people is now readily accessible at um, very low cost. So people can learn more about themselves. They can order kits and um, learn more about themselves and um, have meals customized to meet their needs. And I really like one important thing you mentioned earlier on when you talked about um, making recommendations that gravitate people because it's not a long, it's not what they're used to, it's not what they are um, what their culture uh, um, embraces. And then you're trying to solve one problem, but you're creating another one by by uh, making such recommendations. So knowing people, knowing their preferences, knowing a lot about their genome and um, creating something that's really um, holistic is very, very, I think it's um, it's one of the ways, main ways of the future. So I'm really excited and I, I can't wait to read more, to learn more about uh, culinary medicine as well. So you've written four books. Yes. And um, what are some of the critical messages you would like to pass along? Or why should people get their own copy of each of those books? Well, uh, certainly um, it depends what they like because some of the books are very different. So mm -hmm. uh, the first book was uh, Eating Well, Living Better. And it's almost like a little collection of short stories. Uh, a lot of the recipes in there need, actually need to be redone because it was written over a decade ago and, and the knowledge has grown uh, from mm -hmm. that point. Uh, and and so uh, that's sort of a different book. Ancient Eats is just kind of a fun book. Uh, if you like food, uh, if you're into food, it takes you on a historical journey, uh, for example, to look at the original Mediterranean diet, which is the the, Greek, the diet of classical Greece. And it's actually based on one of the for, first tour guides uh, known in, in the modern Western world, uh, Archaeostratus. And he literally would, you know, go to, uh, you know, what we would uh, call, uh, uh, is, um, you know, Constantinople back then or uh, Byzantium uh, to the ancient Greeks. And he would say, oh, you want to come to, you know, Byzantium in April because the tune is really good. And, and so uh, we take you on kind of that journey. And then the other one uh, we did was the Vikings, which is obviously a very sort of uh, heavier meat and dairy based cattle based uh, culture. Uh, for that, I had my uh, friend who is a uh, the world's expert on Viking food anthropology from Sweden, review my manuscript and make sure that it ticked all the boxes. So uh, it takes you on some kind of just fun journeys there. Uh, the fallacy of the calorie and food shaman are really the the scientific basis of the things we talked about today. So if people are curious on, you know, what is the data? Where does it come from? Uh, maybe you want to understand a little bit more. Those are the two there. And then 
Uh, the new book that I mentioned that uh, probably be out in about a year, uh, I'm currently working on the manuscript, uh, is called Bite Me, uh, which is about <laughs> understanding food is information. That's B-Y-T-E, uh, like a bite of information. Uh, and, and so that will uh, really explain some of the things we talked about in terms of uh, understanding the relationship between food as information and how information relates to energy because most people understand food and and I think miss the point when we talk about oh food is fuel mm -hmm. uh, that just looks at a very small portion of what food is energy and information and matter are all thermodynamically related um, in a way that that we'll, we'll explain. And I just wanted to address one thing that you said because it was so important, which was uh, what we call the three pillars of sustainability in culinary medicine. And so it's got to be sustainable for the individual, right? You got to love the food you eat. I'm a chef. Every time I sit down, I want to I want to enjoy my food. It shouldn't be punishment. It can't be punishment. Um, <laughs> two, uh, is that it needs to be sustain culturally sustainable. And so that is really uh, one of those things that, again, that, that we talked about uh, because that's so important for each of us as individuals, cultures, individuals, you know, identify themselves through things uh, such as language, um, you know, cultural experiences and food, uh, religion, those sorts of things. So it, it needs to be culturally sustainable. If everyone in the world orders a Big Mac, we're going to lose a big part of, you know, that great reservoir of human diversity and the things that we could share uh, with each other. And then finally, we need to make sure that our choices are sustainable for the planet. So I'm not, uh, I, for example, my own personal reasons, you know, I don't do, um, you know, industrial meats. Uh, I, I, I love, you know, meat and beef and things, but I get them locally, you know, sustainably ranged, free ranged, organic uh, produce, etc. Uh, people have to do what they're comfortable with. But we also have to make those decisions, not just, you know, from our perspective of convenience, certainly, not just from a, a pocketbook perspective, but a perspective of, you know, how does it affect the planet? Because, as I said, through our food relationship, um, we are connected to the planet. Definitely. Definitely, we are. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for making time to connect and share with our audience today. It's really been a pleasure just listening and uh, learning from you so if people want to connect with you what's the best way for them to connect with you uh the best way is just please follow me on social media so it's a uh, chef dr mike chef dr mike uh, dot com mm -hmm. and from there you can follow us on facebook twitter uh instagram is, is usually uh where i'm at uh feel mm -hmm. free to dm me um i love getting back to folks i'm not rich and famous so i have to answer all my own social media <laughs> uh so yeah. you know give me a day or two but i answer it all and, and i'll get back to you all right. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, to pleasure. everyone listening, uh, so the next time when we bring another exceptional guest your way, uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay.